Chapter Six of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter Six: A Night in the Water. Yes, that was a pleasant life on picket. In the delicious early summer of the South, and among the endless flowery forests of that blossoming isle, in retrospect, I seem to see myself adrift on a horse's back amid a sea of roses. The various outposts were within a six-mile radius, and it was a long, delightful gallop, day and night. I have found a faint impression that the moon shone steadily every night for two months. And yet I remember certain periods of such dense darkness that in riding through the wood paths it was really unsafe to go beyond a walk, for a fear of branches above and roots below. And one of my officers was once shot at by a rebel scout who stood unperceived at his horse's bridle. To those doing outpost duty on an island, however large, the mainland has all the fascination of forbidden fruit, and on a scale bounded only by the horizon. Emerson says that every house looks ideal until we enter it, and it is certainly so if it be just the other side of those hostile lines. Every grove in that blue distance appears enchanted ground, and yonder loitering grey black leading his horse to water in the furthest distance makes one thrill with a desire to hail him, to shoot at him, to capture him, to do anything to bridge this inexorable dumb space that lies between. A boyish feeling, no doubt. And one that time diminishes without effacing, yet it is a feeling which lies at the bottom of many rash actions in war, and of some brilliant ones. For one, I could never quite outgrow it, though restricted by duty from doing many foolish things in consequence, and also restrained by reverence for certain confidential advisers whom I had always at hand, and who considered it their mission to keep me always on short rations of personal adventure. Indeed, most of that part of entertainment in the army devolves upon scouts detailed for the purpose, volunteer aides de camp, and newspaper reporters, other officers being expected to be about business more prosaic. All of the excitements of war are quadrupled by darkness, and as I rode along our outer lines at night and watched the glimmering flames which, at regular intervals, starred the opposite river shore, the longing was irresistible to cross the barrier of dusk and see whether it were men. Or ghosts who hovered round those dying embers. I had yielded to these impulses in boat adventures by night, for it was a part of my instructions to obtain all possible information about the rebel outposts. And fascinating indeed it was to glide along noiselessly paddling with a dusky guide through the endless intricacies of those southern marshes, scaring the reed birds which wailed and fled away into the darkness, and penetrating several miles into the ulterior between hostile fires where discovery might be death. Yet there were drawbacks as to these enterprises, since it is not easy for a boat to cross still water, even on the darkest night, without being seen by watchful eyes. And moreover, the extremes of high and low tide transform so completely the whole condition of those rivers that it seems very nice calculation to do one's work at precisely the right tune. To vary the experiment, I had often thought of trying a personal reconnaissance by swimming at a certain point whenever circumstances should make it an object. The opportunity at last arrived, and I shall never forget the glee with which, after several postponements, I finally rode forth a little before midnight on a night which seemed made for the purpose. I had, of course, kept my own secret and was entirely alone. The great southern fireflies were out, not haunting the low ground merely like ours, but rising to the loftiest tree tops with weird illumination, and anon hovering so low that my horse often stepped higher to avoid them. The dewy Cherokee roses brushed my face, the solemn Chuck Will's widow croaked her incantation, and the rabbits raced phantom-like across the shadowy road. Slowly, in the darkness, I followed the well-known path to the spot where our most advanced outposts were stationed, holding a causeway which thrust itself out far across the separating river, thus fronting a similar causeway on the other side, while a channel of perhaps three hundred yards once traversed by a ferry boat. Rolled between. At low tide, this channel was the whole river, and the broad, oozy marshes on each side. At high tide, the marshes were submerged, and the stream was a mile wide. This was the point which I had selected. 
To ascertain the numbers and position of the picket on the opposite causeway was my first object, as it was a matter on which no two of our officers agreed. To this point, therefore, I rode, and dismounting after being duly challenged by the sentinel at the causeway head, walked down the long and lonely path. The tide was well up, though still on the flood, as I desired, and each visible tuft of marsh grass might, but for its motionless, have been a prowling boat. Dark as the night had appeared, the water was pale, smooth, and phosphorescent, and I remember that the phrase, Wan Water, so familiar in the Scottish ballads, struck me just then as peculiarly appropriate, though its real meaning is quite different. A gentle breeze, for which I had hoped for a ripple, had utterly died away, and it was a warm, breathless southern night. There was no sound but for the faint swash of the coming tide, the noises of the reed-birds in the marshes, and the occasional leap of a fish, and it seemed to my overstrained ears as if every footstep of my own must be heard for miles. However, I could have no more postponements, and the thing must be tried now, or never. Reaching the farther end of the causeway, I found my men couched like black statues behind the slight earthwork they had constructed. I expected that my proposed immersion would rather bewilder them, but knew that they would say nothing as usual. As for the lieutenant on that post, he was a steady, matter-of-fact, perfectly disciplined Englishman, who wore a Crimean medal, and never asked a superfluous question in his life. If I had casually remarked to him, Mr. Hooper, the General has ordered me on a brief personal reconnaissance to the planet Jupiter, and I wish you to take care of my watch, lest it should be damaged by the procession of the equinoxes. He would have responded with a brief, All right, sir, and a quick military gesture, and have put the thing in his pocket. As it was, I simply gave him the watch, and remarked that I was going for a swim. I do not remember ever to have experienced a greater sense of exhilaration than when I slipped noiselessly into that placid water, and struck out on the smooth, eddying current for the opposite shore. The night was so still and lovely, my black statues looked so dreamlike at their posts behind the low earthwork, the opposite arm of the causeway stretched so invitingly from the rebel main, the horizon glimmered so low around me, for it always appears lower to a swimmer than even to an oarsman, that I seemed floating in such concave globe, some magical crystal, of which I was in the enchanted centre. With each little ripple of my steady progress, all things hovered and changed. The stars danced and nodded above. Where the stars ended, the great southern fireflies began, and closer than the fireflies, there clung round me a halo of phosphorescent sparkles from the soft salt water. Had I told any one of my purpose, I should have had warnings and remonstrances enough. The few negroes who did not believe in alligators believed in sharks, the sceptics as to sharks were orthodox in respect to alligators, while those who rejected both had private prejudices as to snapping turtles. The surgeon would have threatened intermittent fever, the first assistant rheumatism, and the second assistant congestive chills. Non-swimmers would have predicted exhaustion, and swimmers cramp, and all of this before coming within bullet range of any hostilities on the other shore. But I knew the folly of most alarms about reptiles and fishes, Man's imagination peoples the water with many things which do not belong there, or prefer to keep out of his way if they do. Fevers and congestions were the surgeon's business, and I always kept people to their own department. Cramp and exhaustion were dangers I could measure, as I had often done. Bullets were a more substantial danger, and I must take the chance. If a loon could dive at the flash, why not I? If I were once ashore, I should have to cope with the rebels on their own ground which they knew better than I, but the water was my ground where I too had been at home from boyhood. I swam as swiftly and softly as I could, although it seemed as if the water never had been so still before. It appeared impossible that anything uncanny should hide beneath that lovely mirror, and yet when some floating wisp of reed suddenly coiled itself around my neck, or some unknown thing drifting deeper coldly touched my foot, it caused that undefinable shudder which every swimmer knows, and which especially comes over one at night. Sometimes a slight sip of brackish water would enter my lips, for I naturally tried to swim as low as possible, and then would follow a slight gasping and contest against choking that seemed to me a perfect convulsion, 
for I suppose the tendency to choke and sneeze is always enhanced by the circumstances that one's life may depend on keeping still, just as yawning becomes irresistible where to yawn would be social ruin, and just as one is sure to sleep in a church if one sits in a conspicuous pew. At other times my unguarded motion would create a splashing which seemed, in the tension of my senses, to be loud enough to be heard at Richmond, although it really mattered not, since there are fishes in those rivers which make as much noise on special occasions as if they were misguided young whales. As I drew near the opposite shore, the dark causeway projected more and more distinctly, to my fancy at least, and I swam more softly still, utterly uncertain as to how far in the stillness of air and water my phosphorescent course could be traced by eye or ear. A slight ripple would have saved me from observation. I was more than ever sure, and I would have whistled for a fair wind as eagerly as any sailor, but that my breath was worth to me more than anything it was likely to bring. The water became smoother and smoother, and nothing broke the dim surface except a few clumps of rushes and my unfortunate head. The outside of this member gradually assumed to its inside a gigantic magnitude. It had always annoyed me at the hatter's from a merely animal's bigness, with no consummate contents to show for it and now I detested it more than ever. A physical feeling of turgescence and congestion in that region, such as swimmers often feel, probably increased the impression. I thought with envy of the Aztec children, of the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow, of Saint Somebody with his head tucked under his arm. Plotinus was less ashamed of his whole body than I of this inconsiderate and stupid appendage. To be sure, I might swim for a certain distance under water, but that accomplishment I had reserved for a retreat, for I knew that the longer I stayed down, the more surely I should have to snort like a walrus when I came up again, and to approach an enemy with such a demonstration was not to be thought of. Suddenly a dog barked. We had certain information that a pack of hounds was kept at a rebel station a few miles off, on purpose to hunt runaways, and I had heard from the negroes almost fabulous accounts of the instinct of these animals. I knew that, although water baffled their scent, they yet could recognize in some manner the approach of any person across the water as readily as by land, and the vigilance of all dogs by night every traveller among southern plantations has ample demonstration. I was now so near that I could dimly see the figures of men moving to and fro upon the end of the causeway, and could hear the dull knock when one struck his foot against a piece of limber. As my first object was to ascertain whether there were sentinels at that time at that precise point, I saw that I was approaching the end of my experiment. Could I have once reached the causeway unnoticed, I could have lurked in the water beneath its projecting timbers, and perhaps made my way along the main shore, as I had known fugitive slaves to do, while coming from that side. Or, had there been any ripple on the water, to confuse the aroused and watchful eyes, I could have made a circuit and approached the causeway at another point, though I had already satisfied myself that there was only a narrow channel on each side of it, even at high tide, and not, as on our side, a broad expanse of water. Indeed, this knowledge alone was worth all the trouble I had taken, and to attempt much more than this, in the face of a curiosity already roused, would have been a waste of future opportunities. I could try again with the benefit of this new knowledge on a point where the statements of the Negroes had always been contradictory. Resolving, however, to continue the observation a little longer, since the water felt much warmer than I had expected, and there was no sense of chill or fatigue, I grasped at some wisps of straw or rushes that floated nearby, gathering them around my face a little, and then drifting nearer the wharf, in what seemed a sort of eddy, was able, without creating further alarm, to make some additional observations on points, which it is not best now to particularise. Then turning my back upon the mysterious shore, which had thus far lured me, I sank slowly below the surface, and swam as far as I could, under water. During this unseen retreat, I heard, of course, all manner of gurglings and hollow reverberations, and could fancy as many rifle shots as I pleased. But on rising to the surface, all seemed quiet, and even I did not create as much noise as I should have expected. I was now at a safe distance, since the enemy were always chary of showing their boats, and always tried to convince us they had none. What with absorbed attention first, and this submersion afterwards, I had lost all my bearings but the stars, having been long out of sight of my original point of departure. However, 
The difficulties of the return were nothing. Making a slight allowance for the flood tide, which could not yet have turned, I should soon regain the place I had left. So I struck out freshly against the smooth water, feeling just a little stiffened by the exertion, and with the occasional chill running up the back of my neck, but with no nips from sharks, no nudges from alligators, and not a symptom of the fever and arg. Time I could not, of course, measure. One never can in a novel position, but after a reasonable amount of swimming, I began to look with a natural interest for the pier which I had quitted. I noticed, with some solicitude, that the woods along the friendly shore made one continuous shadow, and that the line of low bushes on the long causeway could scarcely be relieved against them. Yet I knew where they ought to be, and the more doubtful I felt about it, the more I put down my doubts, as if they were unreasonable children. One can scarcely conceive of the alteration made in familiar objects by bringing the eye as low as the horizon, especially by night. To distinguish the foreshortening is impossible, and every low near object is equivalent to one higher and more remote. Still I had the stars, and soon my eye, more practised, was enabled to select one precise line of bushes as that which marked the causeway, and for which I must direct my course. As I swam steadily, but with some sense of fatigue towards this phantom line, I found it difficult to keep my faith steady and my progress true. Everything appeared to shift and waver in the uncertain light. The distant trees seemed not trees but bushes, and the bushes seemed not exactly bushes but might, after all, be distant trees. Could I be so confident that, out of all this low stretch of shore, I could select the one precise point where the friendly causeway stretched its long arm to receive me from the water. How easily, some tempter whispered at my ear, might one swerve a little on either side, and be compelled to flounder over half a mile of oozy marsh on an ebbing tide, before reaching our own shore and that hospitable volley of bullets with which it would probably greet me. Had I not already, thus the tempter continued, been swimming rather unaccountably far, supposing me on a straight track for that inviting spot, where my sentinels and my drapery were awaiting my return. Suddenly I felt a sensation of fine ribbons drawn softly across my person, and I found myself among some rushes. But what business had rushes there, or I, among them? I knew that there was not a solitary spot of shoal in the deep channel where I supposed myself swimming, and it was plain in an instant that I had somehow missed my course, and must be getting among the marshes, I felt confident, to be sure, that I could not have widely erred, but was guiding my course for the proper side of the river, but whether I had drifted above or below the causeway, I had not the slightest clue to tell. I pushed steadily forward, with some increasing sense of lassitude, passing one marshy islet after another, all seeming strangely out of place, and sometimes just reaching out with my foot a soft tremulous shoal which gave scarce the shadow of a support though even that shadow rested my feet. At one of these moments of stillness, it suddenly occurred to my perception, what nothing but this slight contact could have assured me in the darkness, that I was in a powerful current, and that this current set the wrong way. Instantly a flood of new intelligence came. Either I had unconsciously turned, and was rapidly nearing the rebel shore, a suspicion which, with a glance at the stars corrected, or else it was the tide itself which had turned, and which was sweeping me down the river with all its force, and was also sucking away at every moment the narrowing water from that treacherous expanse of mud out of whose horrible miry embrace I had lately helped to rescue a shipwrecked crew. Either alternative was rather formidable. I can distinctly remember that for about one half minute the whole vast universe appeared to swim in the same watery uncertainty in which I floated. I began to doubt everything, to distrust the stars, the line of low bushes for which I was wearily striving, the very land on which they grew. If such visionary things could be rooted anywhere. Doubts trembled in my mind like the weltering water, and that awful sensation of having one's feet unsupported, which benumbs the spent swimmer's heart, seemed to clutch at mine, though not yet to enter it. I was more absorbed in that singular sensation of nightmare, such as the one may feel equally when one lost by land or by water, as if one's own position were all right, but the place looked for had been somehow preternaturally abolished out of the universe. At best, might not a man in the water lose all his power of direction, and so move in an endless circle until he sank exhausted? 
It required a deliberate and conscious effort to keep my brain quite cool. I had not the reputation of being of an excitable temperament, but the contrary. Yet I could at that moment see my way to a condition in which one might become insane in an instant. It was as if a fissure opened somewhere, and I saw my way into a madhouse. Then it closed, and everything went on as before. Once in my life I had obtained a slight glimpse of the same sensation, and then too, strangely enough, while swimming, in the mightiest ocean surge into which I had ever dared plunge my mortal body. Keats hints at the same sudden emotion in a wild poem written among the Scottish mountains. It was not the distinctive sensation which drowning men are said to have, that spasmodic passing in review of one's whole personal history. I had no well-defined anxiety, felt no fear, was moved to no prayer, did not give a thought to home or friends. Only it swept over me, as with a sudden tempest, that if I meant to get back to my own camp, I must keep my wits about me. I must not dwell on any other alternative, any more than a boy who climbs a precipice must look down. Imagination had no business here. That way madness lay. There was a shore somewhere before me, and I must get to it, by the ordinary means, before the ebb laid bare the flats, or swept me below the lower bends of the stream. That was all. Suddenly a light gleamed for an instant before me, as if from a house in a grove of great trees upon a bank, and I knew that it must come from the window of a ruined plantation building, where our most advanced outposts had their headquarters. The flash revealed to me every point of the situation. I saw at once where I was, and how I got there, and the tide had turned while I was swimming, and with a much briefer interval of slack water than I had been led to suppose, that I had been swept a good way downstream, and was far beyond all possibility of regaining the point I had left. Could I, however, retain my strength to swim one or two hundred yards further, of which I had no doubt, and if the water did not ebb too rapidly, of which I had more fear, then I was quite safe. Every stroke took me more and more out of the power of the current, and there might be an eddy to aid me. I could not afford to be carried much further, for there the channel made a sweep towards the wrong side of the river, and there was now no reason why I should not reach land. I could dismiss all fear, indeed, except for that of being fired upon by our own sentinels, many of whom were then new recruits, and with the usual disposition to shoot first and investigate afterwards. I found myself swimming in shallow and shallower water, and the flat seemed almost bare where I neared the shore, where the great gnarled branches of the live oaks hung over the muddy bank. Floating on my back for noiselessness, I paddled rapidly with my hands, expecting momentarily to hear the challenge of the picket, and the ominous click so likely to follow. I knew that some one should be pacing to and fro along that beat, but could not tell at what point he might be at that precise moment. Besides, there was the faint possibility that some chatty corporal might have carried the news of my bath thus far along the line, and they might be partially prepared for this unexpected visitor. Suddenly, like another flash, came the quick, quaint challenge. Halt! Who go da? F f friend with the c c countersign, I retorted, with chilly but conciliatory energy rising at full length out of the shallow water to show myself a man and a brother. Advance, friend, and give de countersign, responded the literal soldier, who at such a tune would have accosted a spirit of light or goblin damned with no other formula. I advanced and gave it. He recognized my voice at once. And then and there, as I stood, a dripping ghost, beneath the trees before him, the unconscionable fellow, wishing to exhaust upon me the utmost resources of military hospitality, deliberately presented arms. Now, a soldier on picket, or at night, usually presents arms to nobody. But a sentinel on camp guard by day is expected to perform that ceremony to anything in human shape that has two rows of buttons. Here was a human shape but so utterly buttonless that it exhibited not even a rag to which a button could by any earthly possibility be appended. Buttonless, even potentially, and my blameless Ethiopian presented arms to even this. Where, then, are the theories of Carlyle, the axioms of Cytoresius, the inability of humanity to conceive a naked duke of Windlestraw addressing a naked house of lords? Cautioning my adherent, however, as to do proprieties suitable for such occasion thenceforward, I left him watching the river with renewed vigilance, and awaiting the next merman who should report himself. 
Finding my way to the building, I hunted up a sergeant and a blanket, got a fire kindled in the dismantled chimney, and sat before it in my single garment, like a moist but undismayed Choctaw, until horse and clothing could be brought round from the causeway. It seemed strange that the morning had not yet dawned, after the uncounted periods that must have elapsed, but when the wardrobe arrived, I looked at my watch, and found that my night in the water had lasted precisely one hour. Galloping home, I turned in with the clarity, and without a drop of whisky, and waked a few hours after in excellent condition. The rapid changes of which that department has seen so many, and perhaps to so little purpose, soon transferred us to a different scene. I have been on other scouts since then, and by various processes, but never with a zest so novel as was afforded by that night's experience. The thing got wind in the regiment, and led to only one ill consequence, so far as I know. It rather suppressed a way I had of lecturing the officers on the importance of reducing their personal baggage to a minimum. They got a trick of congratulating me very respectfully on the thoroughness with which I had conformed my practice to my precepts. End of chapter 6 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 7 of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by FNH Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson Chapter 7 Up the Edisto In reading military history, one finds the main interest to lie undoubtedly in the great campaigns where a man, a regiment, a brigade is but a pawn in the game. But there is a charm also in the more free and adventurous life of partisan warfare, where, if the total sphere be humbler, yet the individual has more relative importance, and the scene of action is more personal and keen. This is the reason given by the eccentric revolutionary biographer Weems for writing the life of Washington first, and then that of Marion. And there were, certainly, high in the early adventures of the colored troops of the Department of the South, some of the same elements of picturesqueness that belonged to Marion's band on the same soil, with the added feature that the blacks were fighting for their personal liberties, of which Marion had helped to deprive them. It is stated by Major General Gilmore, in his Siege of Charleston, as one of the three points of his preliminary strategy, that an expedition was sent up by the Edisto River to destroy a bridge on the Charleston and Savannah Railway. As one of the early raids of the colored troops, this expedition may deserve narration, though it was, in a strategic point of view, a disappointment. It has already been told, briefly and on the whole with truth, by Greenlee and others, but I will venture on a more complete account. The project dated back earlier than General Gilmore's siege, and had originally no connection with that movement. It had been formed by Captain Trowbridge and myself in camp, and was based on the facts learned from the men. General Saxton and Colonel W. W. H. Davis, the successive post commanders, had both favoured it. It had been also approved by General Hunter before his sudden removal, though he regarded the bridge as secondary affair, because there was another railway communication between the two cities. But, as the main object was to obtain permission to go, I tried to make the most of all results which might follow. While it was very clear that the raid would harass and confuse the enemy, and be the means of bringing away many of the slaves, General Hunter had therefore accepted the project mainly as a stroke for freedom and black recruits, and General Gilmore, because anything that looked towards action found favour in his eyes, and because it would be convenient to him at that time to effect a diversion, if nothing more. It must be remembered that, after the first capture of Port Royal, the outlying plantations along the whole southern coast were abandoned, and the slaves withdrawn into the interior. It was necessary to ascend some river for thirty miles in order to reach the black population at all. This ascent could only be made by night, and it was slow process, and the smoke of a steamboat could be seen for a great distance. The streams were usually shallow, winding and muddy, and the difficulties of navigation were such as to require a full moon and a flooded tide. 
it was really no easy matter to bring everything to bear, especially as every projected raid must be kept a secret so far as possible. However, we were now somewhat familiar with such undertakings, half military, half naval, and the thing to be done on the Edisto was precisely what had been proved to be practicable on the St. Mary's and the St. John's, to drop anchor before the enemy's door some morning at daybreak without his having dreamed of our approach. Since a raid made by Colonel Montgomery up the Kumbaye two months before, the vigilance of the rebels had increased. But we had information that upon the South Edisto, or Pompon River, the rice plantations were still being actively worked by a large number of Negroes, in reliance on obstructions placed at the mouth of that narrow stream where it joins the main river, some twenty miles from the coast. This point was known to be further protected by a battery of unknown strength at Wilttown Bluff, a commanding and defensible position. The obstructions consisted of a row of strong wooden piles across the river, but we convinced ourselves that these must now be much decayed, and that Captain Trowbridge, an excellent engineer officer, could remove them by the proper apparatus. Our proposition was to man the John Adams, an armed ferry-boat, which had before done us much service, and which had now reverted to the pursuits of peace, it is said, on the East Boston line, to ascend in this to Wilttown Bluff, silence the battery, and clear the passage through the obstructions. Leaving the John Adams to protect this point, we could then ascend the smaller stream with two light draft-boats, and perhaps burn the bridge, which was ten miles higher before the enemy could bring sufficient force to make our position at Wilton Bluff untenable. The expedition was organized essentially upon this plan. The smaller boats were the Enoch Dean, a river steamboat which carried a ten-pound parrot gun and a small howitzer, and a little mosquito of a tug, the Governor Milton, upon which, with the greatest difficulty, we found room for two twelve-pound Armstrong guns, with their gunners forming a section of the 1st Connecticut Battery under Lieutenant Clinton aided by a squad from my own regiment, under Captain James. The John Adams carried, if I remember rightly, two parrot guns of twenty and ten pounds calibre, and a howitzer or two. The whole force of men did not exceed two hundred and fifty. We left Beaufort, S.C., on the afternoon of July ninth, 1863. In former narrations I have sufficiently described the charm of a moonlight ascent into a hostile country, upon an unknown stream, the dark and silent banks, the rippling water, the wail of the reed-birds, the anxious watch, the breathless listening, the veiled lights, the whispered orders. To this was now to be added the vexation of insufficient pilotage, for our negro guide knew only of the upper river, and as it finally proved, not even that, while to take us over the bar which obstructed the main stream, we must borrow a pilot from Captain Dutch, whose gunboat blockaded that point. This active naval officer, however, whose boat expeditions had penetrated all the lower branches of those streams, could not supply our want, and we borrowed from him not only a pilot, but a surgeon to replace our own, who had been prevented by an accident from coming with us. Thus accompanied, we steamed over the bar in safety, and had a peaceful ascent. Past the island of Jehosi, the fine estate of Governor Aiken, then left undisturbed by both sides, and fired our first shell, into the camp at Wilton Bluff at four o'clock in the morning. The battery, whether fixed or movable, we knew not, met us with a promptness that proved very short-lived. After three shots it was silent, but we could not tell why. The bluff was wooded, and we could see but little. The only course was to land under cover of the guns. As the firing ceased and the smoke cleared away, I looked across the rice-fields which lay beneath the bluff, the first sunbeams glowed upon their emerald leaves and on the blossoming hedges along the rectangular dikes. What were those black dots which everywhere appeared? Those moist meadows had become alive with human heads, and along each narrow path came a straggling file of men and women, all on a run for the river. I went ashore with a boatload of troops at once. The landing was difficult and marshy. The astonished negroes tugged us up the bank and gazed at us as if we had been Cortez or Columbus. They kept arriving by land, much faster than we could come by water, every moment increased the crowd, the jostling, the mutual clinging, on that miry foothold. What a scene it was! With the wild faces, eager figures, strange garments, it seemed as if one of the poor things reverently suggested, like nothing but de-judgment day. Presently, 
they began to come from the houses also, with their little bundles on their heads, then with larger bundles. Old women trotting on the narrow paths would kneel to pray a little prayer, still balancing the bundle, and then would suddenly spring up, urged by the accumulation of procession from behind, and would move on till irresistibly compelled by the thankfulness to dip down for another invocation. Reaching us, every human being must grasp our hands and amid exclamations of, Bress you, Massa, and Bress de Lord, at the rate of four of the latter ascriptions to one of the former. Women brought children on their shoulders, small black boys leaned on their black little brothers easily inky, and gravely depositing them, shook hands. Never had I seen human beings so clad, or rather so unclad, in such amazing squalidness and destitution of garments. I recall one small urchin without a rag of clothing save the basque waist of a lady's dress, bristling with whalebones, and worn wrong side before, beneath which his smooth ebony legs emerged like those of an ostrich from its plumage. How weak is imagination, how cold is memory, that I ever cease for a day in my life to see before me the picture of that astounding scene. Yet at the time we were perforce a little impatient of all this piety, protestation, and hand-pressing, for the vital thing was to ascertain what force had been stationed at the bluff, and whether it was yet withdrawn. The slaves, on the other hand, were too much absorbed by their prospective freedom to aid us in taking any further steps to secure it. Captain Trowbridge, who had by this time landed at a different point, got quite into despair over the seeming deafness of the people to all questions. How many soldiers were there on the bluff? he asked of the first comer. Massa, the man said, stutting terribly, I c c c Tell me, how many soldiers are there? roared Trowbridge, in his mighty voice, and all but shaking the poor old thing in his thirst for information. Oh, Massa, recommenced in terror the incapacitated witness, I c c carpenter holding up eagerly a little stump of a hatchet, his sole treasure, as if his profession ought to excuse from all military opinions. I wish that it were possible to present all this scene from the point of view of the slaves themselves. It can be most nearly done, perhaps, by quoting the description given by a similar scene on the Kumbahi River by a very aged man who had been brought down on the previous raid already mentioned. I wrote it down in a tent long after, while the old man recited his tale with much gesticulation at the door, and it is by far the best glimpse I have ever had through a negro's eyes at these wonderful birthdays of freedom. De people was all hoein' massa, said the old man. Dey was a hoein' in the rice fields when de gumboats come. Den every man drop dem ho and de left de rice. De massa he stand and call, run to de woods for hide, Yankee come, sell you to Cuba, run for hide. Every man he run, and my God, run all tud away. Massa stand in de wood, peep, peep, fade for truss afraid to trust. He say, run to de wood, and every man run by him, straight to de boat. De brack soldier, so presumptuous, they come right ashore, hold up de head. Fusting I know, der a barn, ten thousand bushel rough rice, all in a blaze, dem massa's great house, all crackling up de roof. Didn't I care for see em blaze? Law, massa didn't care nothing at all, was gwine to de boat. Dawes Don Quixote could not surpass the sublime absorption to which the old gaunt man, with arm uplifted, described this stage of affairs, till he ended in a shrewd chuckle worthy of Sancho Panza. Then he resumed, De brack soldiers so presumptuous. This he repeated three times, slowly shaking his head in an ecstasy of admiration. It flashed upon me that the apparition of a black soldier must amaze those still in bondage, much as a butterfly just from the chrysalis might astound his fellow grubs. I inwardly vowed that my soldiers at least should be as presumptuous as I could make them. Then he went on. Old woman and I go down to de boat, den they say behind us, rebels comin, rebels comin. Old woman say, come ahead, come plenty ahead. I have nothing on but my shirt and pantaloon. Old woman, one single frock he hab on, and one handkerchief on he head. I left all two of my blanky and run for de rebel come, and den day didn't come, didn't trust for come. I's eighty-eight year old massa, my old massa lounge kept all de ages in a big book, and when we come to age of sense, we mark em down every year, so I know. 
too old for come, massa joking. Never too old for de leave de land a bondage. I old, but great food for children. Give thousand tank every day. Young people can go through, massa, but de old folk must go slow. Such emotions as these, no doubt, were inspired by our arrival. But we could only hear their hasty utterance in passing, our duty being with the small force already landed, to take possession of the bluff. Ascending with proper precautions the wooded hill, we soon found ourselves in the deserted camp of a light battery, amid scattered remaining equipments and suggestions of a very unattractive breakfast. As soon as possible, skirmishes were thrown out through the woods to the farther edge of the bluff, while a party searched the houses, finding the usual large supply of furniture and pictures brought up for safety from below, but no soldiers. Captain Trowbridge had then got the John Adams beside the row of piles, and went to work for their removal. Again, I had the exciting sensation of being within the hostile lines, the eager explorations, the doubts, the watchfulness, the listening for every sound of coming hooves. Presently a horse's tread was heard in earnest, but it was a squad of our own men bringing in two captured cavalry soldiers. One of these, a sturdy fellow, submitted quietly to his lot, only begging that, whenever he should be evacuated from the bluff, a note should be left behind stating that he was a prisoner. The other, a very young man, and a member of the rebel troop, a sort of cadet corpse among the Charleston youths, came to me in great wrath, complaining that the corporal of our squad had kicked him after he had surrendered. His air of offended prize was very rueful, and it did indeed seem a pathetic reversal of fortunes for the two races. To be sure, the youth was a scion from one of the foremost families of South Carolina, and when I considered the wrongs which the black race had encountered from those of his blood, first and last, it seemed as if the most scrupulous recording angel might tolerate one final kick to square the account. But I reproved the corporal, who respectfully disclaimed the charge, and said the kick was an incident of the scuffle. It certainly was not their habit to show such poor malice. They thought too well of themselves. His demeanour seemed less lofty, but perhaps piteous, when he implored me not to put him on board any vessel which was to ascend the upper stream, and hinted, by awful implications, the danger of such ascent. This meant torpedoes, a peril which we treated in those days with rather mistaken contempt. But we found none on the Edisto, and it may be that it was only a foolish attempt to alarm us. Meanwhile, Trowbridge was toiling away at the row of piles, which proved easier to draw out than to saw asunder, either work being hard enough. It took far longer than we had hoped, and we saw noon approach and the tide fall rapidly, taking with it, inch by inch, our hopes of effecting a surprise at the bridge. During this time, and indeed all day, the detachments on shore under Captains Whitney and Sampson were having occasional skirmishes with the enemy, while the coloured people were swarming to the shore or running to and fro like ants with the poor treasures of their houses. Our busy quartermaster, Mr. Bingham, who died afterwards from the overwork of that sultry day, was transporting the refugees on board the steamer, or hunting up bales of cotton, or directing the burning of rice houses, in accordance with our orders. No dwelling houses were destroyed or plundered by our men, Sherman's bummers not having yet arrived, although I asked no questions as to what the plantation negroes might bring in their great bundles. One piece of property, I must admit, seemed a lawful capture, a United States dress-sword of the old pattern, which had belonged to the rebel general who afterwards gave the order to bury Colonel Shaw with his niggers. That I have retained, not without some satisfaction to this day. A passage having been cleared at last, and the tide having turned by noon, we lost no time in attempting the ascent, leaving the bluff to be held by the John Adams, and by a small force on shore. We were scarcely above the obstructions, however, when the little tug went aground, and the Enoch Dean, ascending a mile farther, had an encounter with a battery on the right, perhaps our old enemy, and drove it back. Soon after, she also ran aground, a misfortune of which our opponent strangely took no advantage, and, on getting off, I thought it best to drop down to the bluff again, as the tide was still hopelessly low. None can tell, save those who have tried them, the vexations of those muddy southern streams, navigable only during a few hours of flood-tide. After waiting an hour, the two small vessels again tried the ascent. The enemy on the right had disappeared, 
but we could now see far off on our left another light battery moving parallel with the river, apparently to meet us at some upper bend. But for the present we were safe, and the low rice fields on each side of us, and the scene was so peaceful, it seemed as if all danger were done. For the first time we saw in South Carolina blossoming river banks and low emerald meadows that seemed like New England. Everywhere there were the same rectangular fields, smooth canals and bushy dikes. A few negroes stole out to us in dugouts and breathlessly told us how others had been hurried away by the overseers. We glided safely on mile after mile. The day was unutterably hot, and all else seemed propitious. The men had their combustibles all ready to fire the bridge, and our hopes were unbounded. But, by degrees, the channel grew more tortuous and difficult, and while the little Milton glided smoothly over everything, the Enoch Dean, my own boat, repeatedly grounded. On every occasion of a special need, too, something went wrong in her machinery. Her engine had been constructed on some wholly new patent of which, I should hope, this trial would prove entirely sufficient. The black pilot, who was not a soldier, grew more and more bewildered, and declared that it was the channel and not his brain which had gone wrong. The captain, a little elderly man, sat wringing his hands in the pilot box, and the engineer appeared to be mingling his groans with those of the deceased engine. Meanwhile I, in equal ignorance of machinery and channel, had to give orders only justified by minute acquaintance with both. So I navigated on general principles, until they grounded us on a mud bank, just below a wooded point, and some two miles from the bridge of our destination. It was with a pang that I waved to Major Strong, who was on the other side of the channel in a tug, not to risk approaching us, but to steam on and finish the work if he could. Short was his triumph. Gliding round the point, he found himself instantly engaged with a light battery of four or six guns, doubtless the same we had seen in the distance. The Milton was within two hundred and fifty yards. The Connecticut men fought their guns well, aided by the blacks, and it was exasperating for us to hear the shots while we could see nothing and do nothing. The scanty ammunition on our bow gun was exhausted, and the gun in the stern was useless from that position in which we lay. In vain we moved the men from side to side, rocking the vessel to dislodge it. The heat was terrific that August afternoon. I remember I found myself constantly changing places on the scorched deck, to keep my feet from being blistered. At last the officer in charge of the gun, a hardy lumberman from Maine, got the stern of the vessel so far round that he obtained the range of the battery through the cabin windows. But it would be necessary, he coolly added, on reporting the, to me the fact, to shoot away the corner of the cabin. I knew that this apartment was newly painted and gilded, and the idol of the poor captain's heart, but it was plain that even the thought of his own upholstery could not make the poor soul more wretched than he was. So I bade Captain Dolly, blaze away, and thus we took our hand in that little game, though at our sacrifice. It was of no use. Down drifted our little consort round the point, her engine disabled and her engineer killed, as we afterwards found, though then we could only look and wonder. Still pluckily firing, she floated by upon the tide, which had now turned, and when with a last desperate effort we got off, our engine had one of its impracticable fits, and we could only follow her. The day was waning, and all its range of possibility had lain within the limits of that one tide. Our previous expeditions had been so successful, it now seemed hard to turn back. The river banks and rice fields so beautiful before seemed only a vexation now. But the swift current bore us on, and after our Parthian shots had died away, a new discharge of artillery opened upon us from our first antagonist of the morning, which still kept the other side of the stream. It had taken up a strong position on another bluff, almost out of range of the John Adams, but within easy range of us. The sharpest contest of the day was before us. Happily the engine and the engineer were now behaving well, and we were steering in a channel already traversed, and of which the dangerous points were known. But we had a long straight reach of river before us, heading directly toward the battery, which, having once got our range, had only to keep it while we could do nothing in return. The rebels certainly served their guns well. For the first time I discovered that there were certain compensating advantages in a slightly built craft as compared with one more substantial. The missiles never lodged in the vessel, 
but crash through some thin partition as if it were paper, to explode beyond us, or fall harmlessly in the water. Splintering the chief source of wounds and death in wooden ships was thus entirely avoided. The danger was that our machinery might be disabled, or that shots might strike below the water line and sink us. This, however, did not happen. Fifteen projectiles, as we afterwards computed, passed through the vessel, or cut the rigging. Yet few casualties occurred, and those instantly fatal. As my orderly stood leaning on a comrade's shoulder, the head of the latter was shot off. At last I myself felt a sudden blow in the side, as if from some prize-fighter doubling me up for a moment, while I sank upon a seat. It proved afterwards to have been produced by the grazing of a ball, which, without tearing a garment, had yet made a large part of my side black and blue, leaving a sensation of paralysis, which made it difficult to stand. Supporting myself on Captain Rogers, I tried to comprehend what had happened, and I can remember being impressed by an odd feeling that I had now got my share, and should henceforth be a great deal safer than any of the rest. I am told that this often follows one's first experience of a wound. But this immediate contest, sharp as it was, proved brief. A turn in the river enabled us to use our own stern gun, and we soon glided into the comparative shelter of Wilttown Bluff. There, however, we were to encounter the danger of shipwreck, superadded to that of fight. When the passage through the piles was first cleared, it had been marked by stakes, lest the rising tide should cover the remaining piles and make it difficult to run the passage. But when we again reached it, the stakes had somehow been knocked away, the piles were just covered by the swift current, and the little tugboat was aground upon them. She came off easily, however, with our aid, and when we in turn essayed the passage, we grounded also, but more firmly. We getting off at last, and making the passage, the tug again became lodged, when nearly past danger, and all our efforts proved powerless to pull her through. I therefore dropped down below, and sent the John Adams to her aid, while I superintended the final recall of the pickets, and the embarkation of the remaining refugees. While thus engaged, I felt little solicitude about the boats above. It was certain that the John Adams could safely go close to the piles on the lower side, that she was very strong, and that the other was very light. Still, it was natural to cast some anxious glances up the river, and it was with surprise that I presently saw a canoe descending, which contained Major Strong. Coming on board, he told me with some excitement, that the tug could not possibly be got off, and he wished for orders. It was no time to consider whether it was not his place to have given orders, instead of going half a mile to seek them. I was by this time so far exhausted, that everything seemed to pass me by as one in a dream. But I got into a boat, pushed upstream, met presently the John Adams returning, and was informed by the officer in charge of the Connecticut battery that he had abandoned the tug, and, worse news yet, that his guns had been thrown overboard. It seemed to me then, and as always seemed, that this sacrifice was utterly needless, because although the captain of the John Adams had refused to risk his vessel by going near enough to receive the guns, he should have been compelled to do so. Though the thing was done without my knowledge, and beyond my reach, yet, as commander of the expedition, I was technically responsible. It was hard to blame a lieutenant when his senior had shrunk from a decision, and left him alone nor was it easy to blame Major Strong, whom I knew to be a man of personal courage, though without much decision of character. He was subsequently tried by court-martial and acquitted, after which he resigned, and was lost at sea on his way home. The tug, being thus abandoned, must of course be burned to prevent her falling into the enemy's hands. Major Strong went with prompt fearlessness to do this at my order, after which he remained on the Enoch Dean, and I went on board the John Adams, being compelled to succumb at last, and transfer all remaining responsibility to Captain Trowbridge. Exhausted as I was, I could still observe in a vague way the scene around me. Every available corner of the boat seemed like some vast auction-room of second-hand goods. Great piles of bedding and bundles lay on every side, with black heads emerging and black forms reclining in every stage of squalidness. Some seemed ill, or wounded, or asleep. Others were chattering eagerly among themselves, singing, praying, or soliloquizing on joys to come. Breast de lord, I heard one woman say. I speck I got salt victual now, nothing but fresh victual these six months. 
but eyes get salt victual now, thus reversing under pressure of the salt embargo the usual anticipation of voyagers. Trowbridge told me long after that on seeking a fan for my benefit he could find but one on board, that this was in the hands of a fat old auntie who had just embarked and sat on an enormous bundle of her goods in everybody's way, fanning herself vehemently and ejaculating as her gasping breath would permit, Oh, do Jesus, oh, do Jesus, when the captain abruptly disarmed her of her fan and left her continuing her pious exercises. Thus we glided down the river, in the waning light. Once more we encountered a battery making five in all. I could hear the guns of the assailants, and could not distinguish the explosion of their shells, and the answering throb of our own guns. The kind quartermaster kept bringing me news of what occurred, like Rebecca in front de Bacuf's castle, but discreetly withholding any actual casualties. Then all faded into safety and sleep, and we reached the Beaufort in the morning after thirty-six hours of absence. A kind friend, who acted in South Carolina a nobler part amid tragedies than in any other early stage of triumphs, met us with an ambulance at the wharf, and the prisoners, the wounded, and the dead were duly attended. The reader will not care for any personal record of convalescence, though among the general military laudations of whiskey, it is worth while to say that one life was saved in the opinion of my surgeons, by the habitual abstinence from it, leaving no food for peritoneal inflammation to feed upon. The able-bodied men who had joined us were sent to a General Gilmore in the trenches, while their families were established in the huts and tents on St. Helena Island. A year after, greatly to the delight of the regiment in taking possession of a battery, which they had helped to capture on James Island, they found in their hands the self-same guns which they had seen thrown overboard from the Governor Milton. They then felt that their account with the enemy was squared and could proceed to further operations. Before the war, how great a thing seemed the rescue of even one man from slavery, and since the war has emancipated all, how little seems the liberation of two hundred. But no one then knew how the contest might end, and when I think of that morning sunlight, those emerald fields, those thronging numbers, the old women and their prayers, and the little boys with them, living burdens, I know that the day was worth all it cost, and more. End of chapter 7 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 8 of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson Chapter 8 The Baby of the Regiment We were in our winter camp on Port Royal Island. It was a lovely November morning, soft and spring-like. The mockingbirds were singing, and the cotton fields still white with fleecy pods. Morning drill was over. The men were cleaning their guns and singing very happily. The officers were in their tents, reading still more happily the letters arrived from home. Suddenly I heard a knock at my tent door, and the latch clicked. It was the only latch in the camp, and I was very proud of it, and the officers always clicked it as loudly as possible in order to gratify my feelings. The door opened, and the quartermaster thrust in the most beaming face I ever saw. Colonel, said he, there are great news for the regiment. My wife and baby are coming by the next steamer. Baby, said I, in amazement. Q.M., you are beside yourself. We always called the quartermaster Q.M. for shortness. There was a pass sent to your wife, but nothing was ever said about a baby. Baby, indeed. "'But the baby was included in the pass,' replied the triumphant father of a family. "'You don't suppose my wife would come down here without her baby? "'Besides, the pass itself permits her to bring necessary baggage. "'And is not a baby six months old necessary baggage?' "'But, my dear fellow,' said I rather anxiously, "'how can you make a little thing comfortable in a tent "'amidst these rigours of a South Carolina winter, "'when it is uncomfortably hot for drill at noon?' 
and ice forms in your bedside at night. Trust me for that, said the delighted papa, and went off whistling. I could hear him telling the same news to three others at least before he got to his own tent. That day the preparations began, and soon his abode was a wonderful comfort. There were posts, and rafters, and a raised floor, and a great chimney, and a door with hinges, every luxury, except a latch, and that he could not have, for mine was the last that could be purchased. One of the regimental carpenters was employed to make a cradle, and another to make a bedstead high enough for the cradle to go under. Then there must be a bit of red carpet beside the bedstead, and thus the progress of splendour went on. The wife of one of the coloured sergeants was engaged to act as a nursery maid. She was a very respectable young woman, the only objection to her being that she smoked a pipe. But we thought perhaps a baby might not dislike tobacco, and if she did, she would have excellent opportunities to break the pipe in pieces. In due time the steamer arrived, and baby and her mother were among the passengers. The little recruit was soon settled in a new cradle, and slept in it as if she had never known any other. The sergeant's wife soon had her on exhibition through the neighbourhood, and from that time forward she was quite a queen among us. She had sweet blue eyes and pretty brown hair with round dimpled cheeks, and that perfect dignity which is so beautiful in a baby. She hardly ever cried, and was not at all timid. She would go to anybody, and yet did not encourage any romping from any but the most intimate friends. She always wore a warm, long-sleeved scarlet cloak with a hood, and in this costume was carried, or toted, as the soldiers said, all about the camp. At guard mounting in the morning, when the men who were to go on guard duty for the day are drawn up to be inspected, Baby was always there, to help inspect them. She did not say much, but she eyed them very closely, and seemed fully to appreciate their bright buttons. Then the officer of the day, who appears at guard mounting with his sword and sash, and comes afterwards to the colonel's tent for orders, would come and speak to Baby on his way, and receive her orders first. When the time came for drill, she was usually present to watch the troops, and when the drum beat for dinner, she liked to see the long row of men in each company march up to the cookhouse in single file, each with a tin cup and plate. During the day, in pleasant weather, she might be seen in her nurse's arms, about the company streets, and centre of an admiring circle, her scarlet costume looking very pretty amidst the shining black cheeks and neat blue uniforms of the soldiers. At dress parade, just before sunset, she was always an attendant. As I stood before the regiment, I could see the little spots of red out of the corner of my eye at one end of the long line of men, and I looked with so much interest for her small person, that instead of saying at the proper time, "'Attention, battalion! Shoulder arms!' It is a wonder that I did not say, Shoulder babies! Our little lady was very impartial, and distributed her kind looks to everybody. She had not the slightest prejudice against colour, and did not care in the least whether her particular friends were black or white. Her especial friends, I think, were the drummer boys, who were not my favourites by any means, for they were a roguish set of scamps, and gave more trouble than all the grown men in the regiment. I think Annie liked them because they were small, and made a noise and had red caps like her hood, and red facings on their jackets, and also because they occasionally stood on their heads for her amusement. After dress parade, the whole drum corps would march to the great flag staff, and wait till just sunset time, when they would beat the retreat, and then the flag would be hauled down, a great festival for Annie. Sometimes the sergeant major would wrap her in the great folds of the flag, after it was taken down, and she would peep out very prettily from amidst the stars and stripes like a new-born goddess of liberty. About once a month some inspecting officer was sent to the camp by the general in command to see the condition of everything in the regiment, from bayonets to buttons. It was usually a long and tiresome process, and when everything was done, I used to tell the officer that I had one more thing for him to inspect, which was peculiar to our regiment. Then I would send for baby to be exhibited, and I never saw an inspecting officer, old or young, who did not look pleased at the sudden appearance of the little fresh smiling creature, a flower in the midst of war. And Annie, in her turn, would look at them, with the true baby dignity la her face, that deep, earnest look which babies often have, and which people think so wonderful when Raphael paints it, although they might often see just the same expression in the faces of their own darlings at home. Meanwhile, Annie seemed to like the camp style of housekeeping very much, 
her father's tent was double, and he used the front apartment for his office and the inner room for parlour and bedroom, while the nurse had a separate tent and washroom behind all. I remember that, for the first time I went there in the evening, it was to borrow some writing paper, and while baby's mother was hunting for it in the front tent, I heard a great cooing and murmuring in the inner room. I asked if Annie was still awake, and her mother told me to go in and see. Pushing aside the canvas door, I entered. No sign of anybody was to be seen, but a variety of soft little happy noises seemed to come from some unseen corner. Mrs. C. came quietly in, pulled away the counterpane of her own bed, and drew out the rough cradle where lay the little damsel, perfectly happy, and wider awake than anything but a baby possibly can be. She looked as if the seclusion of a dozen family bedsteads would not be enough to discourage her spirits, and I saw that camp life was likely to suit her very well. A tent can be kept very warm, for it is merely a house with a thinner wall than usual, and I do not think that the baby felt the cold much more than if she had been at home that winter. The great trouble is that a tent chimney not being built very high is apt to smoke when the wind is in a certain direction, and when that happens it is hardly possible to stay inside. So we used to build the chimneys of some tents on the east side, and those of others on the west, and thus some of the tents were always comfortable. I have seen baby's mother running in a hard rain with little red riding hood in her arms to take refuge with the adjutant's wife when every other abode was full of smoke. And I must admit that there was one or two windy days that season when nobody could really keep warm, and Annie had to remain ignominiously in her cradle, with as many clothes on as possible, for almost the whole time. The quartermaster's tent was very attractive to us in the evening. I remember that once on passing near it after nightfall, I heard our major's fine voice singing Methodist hymns within, and Mrs. C.'s sweet tones chiming in. So I peeped through the outer door. The fire was burning very pleasantly in the inner tent, and the scrap of new red carpet made the floor look quite magnificent. The major sat on a box, our surgeon on a stool. Q.M. and his wife's, and the adjutant's wife, and one of the captains, were all sitting on the bed, singing as well as they knew how, and the baby was under the bed. Baby had retired for the night, was overshadowed, suppressed, sat upon, and the singing went on, and she had wandered away in her own land of dreams, nearer to heaven, perhaps, than any pitch their voices could attain. I went in and joined the party. Presently the music stopped, and another officer was sent for, to sing some particular song. At this pause the invisible innocent waked a little, and began to cluck and coo. "'It's the kitten!' exclaimed somebody. "'It's my baby!' exclaimed Mrs. C. triumphantly, in that tone unfailing personal pride which belongs to young mothers. The people all got up from the bed for a moment, while Annie was pulled from beneath, wide awake and placid as usual. She sat in one lap after another, during the rest of the concert, sometimes winking at the candle, but usually listening to the songs, with a calm and critical expression, as if she could make as much noise as any of them, whenever she saw fit to try. Not a sound did she make, however, except one little soft sneeze, which led to an immediate flood-tide of red shawl, covering every part of her but her forehead. But I soon hinted that the concert had better be ended, because I knew from observation that the small damsel had carefully watched a regimental inspection and a brigade jill on that day, and that an interval of repose was certainly necessary. Annie did not long remain the only baby in camp. One day, on going out to the stables to look at a horse, I heard a sound of baby talk addressed by some man to a child nearby, and looking round the corner of a tent, I saw that one of the hostlers had something black and round lying in the sloping side of a tent, with which he was playing very eagerly. It proved to be his baby, a plump, shiny thing, younger than Annie, and I never saw a merrier picture than the happy father frolicking with his child, while the mother stood quietly by. This was baby number two, and she stayed in camp several weeks, the two innocents meeting each other every day in the placid indifference that belonged to their years. Both were happy little healthy things, and it never seemed to cross their minds that there was any difference in their complexions. As I said before, Annie was not troubled by any prejudice in regard to colour, nor do I suppose that the other little maiden was. Annie enjoyed the tent life very much, but when we were sent out on picket soon after, she enjoyed it still more. Our headquarters was at a deserted plantation house with one large parlour, a dining room, and a few bedrooms. Baby's father and mother had a room upstairs with a stove whose pipe went straight out at the window. 
This was quite comfortable, though half the windows were broken, and there was no glass and no glazier to mend them. The windows of the large parlour were in much the same condition, though we had an immense fireplace, where we had a bright fire whenever it was cold, and always in the evening. The walls of this room were very dirty, and it took our ladies several days to cover all the unsightly places with wreaths and hangings of evergreen. In the performance, Baby took an active part. Her duties consisted in sitting in a great nest of evergreen, pulling and fingering the fragrant leaves, and occasionally giving a little cry of glee when she had accomplished some piece of decided mischief. There was less entertainment to be found in the camp itself at this time, but we, the household at headquarters, was larger than Baby had been accustomed to. We had a great deal of company, moreover, and she had quite a gay life of it. She usually made her appearance in the large parlour soon after breakfast, and to dance her for a few moments in our arms was one of the first daily duties of each one. Then the morning reports began to arrive from different outposts, a mounted officer or courier coming in from each place, dismounting at the door, and clattering in with jingling arms and spurs, each a new excitement for Annie. She usually got some attention from any officer who came, receiving, with her wanted dignity, any daring caress. When the messengers had ceased to be interesting, there was always the horses to look at, held or tethered under the trees beside the sunny piazza. After the various couriers had been received, other messengers would be dispatched to the town, several miles away, and Baby had full of excitement of the mounting and departure. Her father was often one of the riders, and would sometimes see Zanny for a good-bye kiss, place her on the saddle before him, gallop her round the house once or twice, and then give her back to the nurse's arms again. She was perfectly fearless, and such boisterous attention never frightened her, nor did they ever interfere with her sweet, infantine self-possession. After the riding parties had gone, there was the piazza still for entertainment, with a sentinel pacing up and down before it. But Annie did not enjoy the sentinel, though his breastplate and buttons shone like gold, so much as the hammock which always hung swinging between the pillars. It was a pretty hammock, with great open meshes, and she delighted to lie in it, and have the netting closed above her, so that she could only be seen through the apertures. I can see her now, the fresh little rosy thing in her blue and scarlet wrappings, with one round and dimpled arm thrust forth through the netting, and the other grasping an armful of blushing roses and fragrant magnolias. She looked like those pretty French bass reliefs of cupids imprisoned in baskets, and peeping through. That hammock was a very useful appendage. It was a couch for us, a cradle for baby, a nest for the kittens, and we had, moreover, a little hen which liked to roost there every night. When the mornings were colder, and the stove upstairs smoked the wrong way, Baby was brought down in a very incomplete state of toilet, and finished her dressing by the great fire. We found her bare shoulders very becoming, and she was still very much interested in her own pink toes. After a very slow dressing, she had still a slower breakfast, out of a tin cup of warm milk, of which she generally spilt a good deal, as she had much to do in watching everybody who came into the room, and seeing that there was no mischief done. Then she would be placed on the floor, on our only piece of carpet, and the kittens would be brought in for her to play with. We had at different times a variety of pets, of whom Annie did not take much notice. Sometimes we had young partridges caught by the drummer boys in trap cages. The children called them Bob and Chloe, because the first notes of the male and female sounded like those names. One day I brought home an opossum, with a blind bare young still clinging to the droll pouch where their mothers keep them. Sometimes we had pretty green lizards, their colour darkening or deepening like that of chameleons, in light or shade. But the only pets that took baby's fancy were the kittens. They perfectly delighted her from the first moment she saw them, and they were the only things younger than herself that she had ever beheld, and the only things softer than themselves that her small hands had grasped. It was astonishing to see how much the kittens would endure from her. They could scarcely be touched by anyone else without mewing, but when Annie seized one by the head and the other by the tail and rubbed them violently together, they did not make a sound. I suppose that a baby's grasp is really soft, even if it seems ferocious, and so it gives less pain than one would think. At any rate, the little animals had the best of it very soon, for they entirely outstripped Annie in learning to walk, and they could soon scramble away beyond her reach, 
while she sat in a soft, dumb despair, unable to comprehend why anything so much smaller than herself could be so much more nimble. Meanwhile the kittens would sit up, look at her with the most provoking indifference just out of her arm's length, until some of us would take pity on the young lady and toss her furry playthings back to her again. Little baby, she learned to call them, and these were the very first words she spoke. Baby had evidently a natural turn for war, further cultivated by an intimate knowledge of drills and parades. The nearer she came to actual conflict, the better she seemed to like it, peaceful as her own little ways might be. Twice at least, while she was with us on picket, we had alarms from the rebel troops, who would bring down cannon to the opposite side of the ferry about two miles beyond us, and throw shot and shell over our side. Then the officer at the ferry would think that there was to be an attack made, and couriers would be sent riding to and fro, and the men would all be called to arms in a hurry, and the ladies at headquarters would all put on their best bonnets and come down the stairs, and the ambulance would be made ready to carry them to a place of safety before the expected fight. On such occasions Baby was all in her glory. She shouted with delight at being suddenly uncribbed and thrust into a little scarlet cloak, and brought downstairs at an utterly unusual and improper hour to a piazza with lights and people and horses and general excitement. She crowed and gurgled and made gestures with her little fists, and screamed out what seemed to be her advice on the military situation, as freely as if she had been a newspaper editor. Except that it was rather difficult to understand her precise direction. I do not know, but the whole rebel force might have been captured through her plans. But at any rate, I should much rather obey her orders than those of some generals whom I have known, for she at least meant no harm, and would lead one into no mischief. However, at last the danger, such as it was, would all be over, and the ladies would be induced to go peacefully to bed again, and Annie would retreat with them to her ignoble cradle, very much disappointed, and looking vainly back to the more martial scene below. The next morning she would seem to have forgotten all about it, and would spill her bread and milk by the fire, as if nothing had happened. I suppose we hardly knew at the time how large a part of the sunshine of our daily lives was contributed by dear little Annie. Yet when I look back on that pleasant southern home, she seems as essential a part of it as the mockingbirds or the magnolias, and I cannot convince myself that in returning to it I should not find her there. But Annie went back with the spring to her northern birthplace, and then passed away from this earth before her little feet had fairly learned to tread its paths, and when I meet her next it must be in some world where there is triumph without armies, and where innocence is trained in scenes of peace. I know, however, that her little life, short as it seemed, was a blessing to us all, giving us a perpetual image of serenity and sweetness, recalling the lovely atmosphere of far-off homes, and holding us by unsuspected ties to whatever things were pure. End of chapter 8 Recording by FNH. Visit www.bookranger.co.uk. Chapter 9 of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 9. Negro Spirituals. The war brought to some of us, besides its direct experiences, many a strange fulfillment of dreams of other days. For instance, the present writer had been a faithful student of Scottish ballads, and had always envied Sir Walter the delight of tracing them out amid their own heather, and of writing them down piecemeal from the lips of aged crones. It was a strange enjoyment, therefore, to be suddenly brought into the midst of a kindred world of unwritten songs, as simple and indigenous as the border minstrelsy, more uniformly plaintive, almost always more quaint, and often as essentially poetic. The interest was rather increased by the fact that I had for many years heard of this class of songs under the name of Negro Spirituals, and had even heard some of them sung by friends from South Carolina. I could now gather on their own soil these strange plants, 
which I had before seen as in museums alone. True, the individual songs rarely coincided, but there was a line here, a chorus there, just enough to fix the class, but this was unmistakable. It was not strange that they differed, for the range seemed almost endless, and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida seemed to have nothing but the generic character in common, until all were mingled into a united stock of camp melodies. Often in the starlit evening, I have returned from some lonely ride by the swift river, or on the plover-haunted barrens, and, entering the camp, have silently approached some glimmering fire, round which the dusky figures moved in the rhythmical barbaric dance the negroes call a shout, chanting, often harshly, but always in the most perfect time with some monotonous refrain. Writing down in the darkness, as best I could, perhaps with my hand in the safe covert of my pocket, the words of the song. I have afterwards carried it to my tent, like some captured bird or insect, and then, after examination, put it by. Or, summoning one of the men at some period of leisure, Corbett Rubble Sutton, for instance, whose iron memory held all the details of a song as if it were a ford or a forest, I have completed the new specimen by supplying the absent parts. The music I could only retain by ear, and though the most common strains were often repeated, enough to fix the impression, there were others that occurred only once or twice. The words will be here given, as nearly as possible in the original dialect, and if the spelling seems sometimes inconsistent, or the misspelling insufficient, it is because I could get no nearer. I wish to avoid what seems to me the only error of Lowell's big low papers in respect to dialect, the occasional use of an extreme misspelling, which merely confuses the eye, without taking us any closer to the peculiarity of the sound. The favourite song sung in camp was the following, sung with no accompaniment, but the measured clapping of hands and the chatter of many feet. It was sung perhaps twice as often as any other. This was partly due to the fact that it properly consisted of a chorus alone, with which the verses of other songs might be combined at random. 1. Hold your light. Hold your light, brother Robert. Hold your light, hold your light on Canaan's shore. What make old Satan for follow me so? Satan ain't got nothing to do with me. Hold your light, hold your light, hold your light on Canaan's shore. This would be sung for half an hour at a time, perhaps each person present being named in turn. It seemed the simplest primitive type of spiritual. The next in popularity was almost as elementary, and, like this, named successively each one of the circle. It was, however, much more resounding and convivial in its music. 2. Bound to Go Jordan River, I'm bound to go, bound to go, bound to go. Jordan River, I'm bound to go, and bid em fare ye well. My brother Robert, I'm bound to go, bound to go. My sister Lucy, I'm bound to go, bound to go. Sometimes it was tink em, think them, fare ye well. The ye was so detached that I thought at first it was very, or very well. Another picturesque song, which seemed immensely popular, was at first very bewildering to me. I could make out the first words of the chorus, and called it the Roman Da, being reminded of some romantic song which I had formerly heard. That association quite fell in with the Orientalism of the new tent life. 3. Room in There O oh, my mother is gone, my mother is gone, my mother is gone into heaven, my lord. I can't stay behind. There's room in da, room in da, room in da, in de heaven, my lord. I can't stay behind, can't stay behind, my dear, I can't stay behind. O oh, my father is gone. O oh, de angels are gone. O oh, eyes been on de road, eyes been on de road, eyes been on de road into heaven, my lord. I can't stay behind. O oh, room in dare, room in dare, room in dare in de heaven, my lord. I can't stay behind. By this time every man within hearing from oldest to youngest would be wriggling and shuffling, as if through some magic piper's bewitchment, for even those who at first affected contemptuous indifference would be drawn into the vortex ere long. Next to these in popularity ranked a class of songs belonging emphatically to the church militant, and available for camp purposes with very little strain upon their symbolism. 
This, for instance, had a true companion in arms heartiness about it, not impaired by the feminine invocation at the end. 4. Hail Mary. One more valiant soldier here. One more valiant soldier here. One more valiant soldier here. To help me bear de cross. O oh, hail Mary, hail. Hail Mary, hail. Hail Mary, hail. To help me bear de cross. I fancied that the original reading might have been soul instead of soldier, with some other syllable inserted to fill out the meter, and that the Hail Mary might denote a Roman Catholic origin, as I had several men from St. Augustine who held in a dim way to that faith. It was a very ringing song, though not so grandly jubilant as the next, which was really impressive as the singers pealed it out when marching or rowing or embarking. 5. My army cross over. My army cross over. My army cross over. O Pharaoh's army drowned. My army cross over. We'll cross de mighty river. My army cross over. We'll cross de river Jordan. My army cross over. We'll cross de danger water. My army cross over. We'll cross de mighty Mayo. My army cross over. Thrice. O Pharaoh's army drowned. My army cross over. I could get no explanation of the mighty Mayo, except that one of the old men thought it meant the river of death. Perhaps it is an African word in the Cameroon dialect. Mawa signifies to die. The next also has a military ring about it, and the first line is well matched by the music. The rest is a conglomerate, and one or two lines show a more northern origin. Dunn is a Virginia sibboleth, quite distinct from the bean which replaces it in South Carolina. Yet one of their best choruses, without any fixed words, was De Bell Dun Ringing, for which in proper South Carolina dialect would be substituted De Bell Bin a Ringing. This refrain may have gone south with our army. 6. Ride in, kind saviour. Ride in, kind saviour. No man can hinder me. O oh, Jesus is a mighty man. No man. We're marching through Virginia fields. No man. O oh, Satan is a busy man. No man. And he has his sword and shield. No man. O oh, old Sisesh, done come and gone. No man can hinder me. Sometimes they substituted binder me, which was more spicy to the ear and more in keeping with the usual head over heels arrangement of their pronouns. Almost all of their songs were thoroughly religious in their tone, however quaint then the expression, and were in a minor key, both as to words and music. The attitude is always the same, and, as a commentary on life of the race, is infinitely pathetic. Nothing but patience for this life, nothing but triumph in the next. Sometimes the present predominates, sometimes the future, but the combination is always implied. In the following, for instance, we hear simply the patience. 7. This world almost done. Brother, keep your lamp trimming and a burning. Keep your lamp trimming and a burning. Keep your lamp trimming and a burning. For this world most done, so keep your lamp. This world most done. But in the next, the final reward of patience is proclaimed as plaintively. 8. I want to go home. There's no rain to wet you. Oh, yes, I want to go home. There's no sun to burn you. Oh, yes, I want to go home. Oh, push along, believers. Oh, yes. There's no hard trials. Oh, yes. There's no whips a cracking. Oh, yes. My brother on de wayside. Oh, yes. Oh, push along, my brother. Oh, yes. Where there's no stormy weather. Oh, yes. There's no tribulation. Oh, yes. And the next was a boat song, and timed well with the tug of the oar. 9. The Coming Day I want to go to Canaan. I want to go to Canaan. I want to go to Canaan, to meet em at de coming day. Oh, remember, let me go to Canaan, thrice. To meet em. Oh, brother, let me go to Canaan, thrice. To meet em. Oh, brother, you, oh, remember. To meet him at de coming day. The following begins with a startling affirmation, 
yet the last line quite outdoes the first. This, too, was a capital boat song. 10. One more river. O oh, Jordan Bank was a great old bank. There ain't but one more river to cross. We have some valiant soldier here. Dare ain't. O oh, Jordan's stream will never run dry. Dare ain't. There's a hill on my left, and he catch on my right. There ain't but one more river to cross. I could get no explanation for this last riddle, except, dat mean if you go on de left, go to struction, and if you go on de right, go to God for sure. In other, more spiritual conflict is implied, as in this next. 11. O dying lamb. I wants to go where Moses trod, O de dying lamb. For Moses gone to de promised land, O de dying lamb. To drink from springs that never run dry, O. Cry O, my lord, O. Before I'll stay in hell one day, O. I'm in hopes to pray my sins away, O. Cry O, my lord, O. Brother Moses promised for be dar too, O. To drink from streams that never run dry, O de dying lamb. In the next, the conflict is at its height, and the lurid imagery of the apocalypse is brought to bear. This book, with the books of Moses, constituted their Bible. All that lay between, even the narratives of the life of Jesus, they hardly cared to read or to hear. 12. Down in the Valley We'll run and never tire. We'll run and never tire. We'll run and never tire. Jesus sets poor sinners free, way down in the valley. Who will rise and go with me? You've heard talk of Jesus, who set poor sinners free. De lightning and de flashing. De lightning and de flashing. De lightning and de flashing. Jesus set poor sinners free. I can't stand the fire, thrice. Jesus set poor sinners free. De green trees are flaming, thrice. Jesus set poor sinners free. Way down in de valley. Who will rise and go with me? You've heard talk of Jesus, who set poor sinners free. De Valley and De Lonesome Valley were familiar words in their religious experience. To descend into that region implied the same process with the anxious seat of the camp meeting. When a young girl was supposed to enter it, she bound a handkerchief by a peculiar knot over her head and made it a point of honour not to change a single garment till the day of her baptism so that she was sure of being in physical readiness for the cleansing rite, whatever her spiritual mood might be. More than once in noticing a damsel thus mystically kerchiefed, I have asked some dusky attendant its meaning, and have received the unfailing answer, framed with their usual indifference to the genders of pronouns, He in de lonesome valley, sir. The next gives the same dramatic conflict, while its detached and impersonal refrain give it strikingly the character of the Scotch and Scandinavian ballads. 13. Cry holy. Cry holy, holy. Look at de people dat is born of God. And I run down de valley, and I run down to pray. Says, look at de people dat is born of God. When I get dar, cap and Satan was dar. Says, look at. Says, young man, young man, there's no use for pray says look at for jesus is dead and god gone away says look at and i made him out a liar and i went my way says look at sing holy holy o mary was a woman and he had a one son says look at and de jews and de romans had him hung says look at cry holy holy and i tell you sinner you had better had pray, says look at. For hell is a dark and dismal place, says look at. And I tell you, sinner, and I wouldn't go dar, says look at. Cry holy, holy. Here is an infinitely quaint description of the length of the heavenly road. 14. O'er the crossing. Vendors my old mudder. Been a wagging at de hill so long. It's about time she'll cross over. Get home, Bimeby. Keep praying, I do believe. We're a long time wagging o'er de crossing. 
Keep praying, I do believe. We'll get home to heaven, bime be. Hear dat mournful thunder, Roll from door to door, Calling home God's children, Get home, bime be. Little chillin, I do believe, We're a long time. Little chillin, I do believe, We'll get home. See dat fork lightning, Flash from tree to tree, Calling home God's chillin. Get home, bimby. True believer, I do believe. We're a long time. O oh, brothers, I do believe. We'll get home to heaven, bimby. One of the most singular pictures of future joys, and with fine flavour of hospitality about it, was this. 15. Walk em easy. O oh, walk em easy round de heaven. Walk em easy round de heaven. Walk em easy round de heaven. Dat all de people may join de band. Walk em easy round de heaven, thrice. O oh, shout glory till em join dat band. The chorus was usually the greater part of the song, and often came in paradoxically thus. 16. O oh, yes, Lord. O oh, must I be like de foolish mans? O oh, yes, Lord. We'll build de house on de sandy hill. O oh, yes, Lord. I'll build my house on Zion Hill. O oh, yes, Lord. No wind nor rain can blow me down. O oh, yes, Lord. The next is very graceful and lyrical, and with more variety of rhythm than usual. 17. Bow low, Mary. Bow low, Mary, bow low, Martha. For Jesus come and lock de door, and carry de keys away. Sail, sail over yonder, and view de promised land. For Jesus come. Weep, O Mary, bow low, Martha. For Jesus come. Sail, sail, my true believer. Sail, sail over yonder. Mary, bow low. Martha, bow low. For Jesus come and lock de door and carry de keys away. But all of the spirituals that which surprised me the most, I think, perhaps because it was that in which external nature furnished the images most directly, was this. With all my experience of their ideal ways of speech, I was startled when I came on such a flower of poetry in that dark soil. 18. I know moon rise. I know moon rise, I know star rise. Lay dis body down. I walk in de moonlight, I walk in de starlight, to lay dis body down. I walk in de graveyard, I walk through de graveyard, to lay dis body down. I'll lie in de grave, and stretch out my arms, lay dis body down. I go to de judgment in de evening of de day, when I lay dis body down. And my soul and your soul will meet in de day, when I lay dis body down. I'll lie in de grave, and stretch out my arms. Never it seems to me, since man first lived and suffered, was his infinite longing for peace uttered more plaintively than in that line. The next one is of the wildest and most striking of the whole series. There is a mystical effect and a passionate striving throughout the whole. The scriptural struggle between Jacob and the angel, which is only dimly expressed in the words, seems all uttered in the music. I think it impressed my imagination more powerfully than any of the other songs. 19. Wrestling Jacob O oh, wrestling Jacob, Jacob, days are breaking, I will not let thee go. O oh, wrestling Jacob, Jacob, days are breaking, he will not let me go. O oh, I hold my brother with a trembling hand, I would not let him go. I hold my sister with a trembling hand, I would not let her go. O oh, Jacob do hang from a trembling limb, he would not let him go. O oh, Jacob do hang from a trembling limb, de Lord will bless my soul. O oh, wrestling Jacob, Jacob. Of occasional hymns, properly so called, I notice but one, a funeral hymn for an infant, which is sung plaintively over and over without variety of words. 20. The Baby Gone Home De little baby gone home, de little baby gone home, de little baby gone along, for to climb up Jacob's ladder, and I wish I'd been da, I wish I'd been da, I wish I'd been da, my lord for to climb up Jacob's ladder. Still simpler is this, which is yet quite sweet and touching. 21. 
Jesus with us. He have been with us, Jesus. He still with us, Jesus. He still with us, Jesus. Be with us to the end. The next seemed to be a favourite about Christmas time, when mediations on de rolling year were frequent among them. 22. Lord, remember me. O do, Lord, remember me. O do, Lord, remember me. O do remember me, until de year roll around. Do, Lord, remember me. If you want to die like Jesus died, lay in de grave, you would fold your arms and close your eyes, and die with a free good will. For death is a simple ting, and he go from door to door, and he knock down some, and he cripple op some, and he leave some here to pray. O oh, do, Lord, remember me. O oh, do, Lord, remember me. My old father's gone till de year roll round. Do, Lord, remember me. The next was sung in such an operatic and rollicking way that it was quite hard to fancy it a religious performance, which, however, it was. I heard it but once. 23. Early in the morning. I met little Rosa early in de morning. O Jerusalem, early in de morning. And I ax her, how do you do, my daughter? O Jerusalem, early in de morning. I meet my mother early in de morning. O Jerusalem. And I ax her, how do you do, my mother? O Jerusalem. I meet my brother Robert early in de morning. O Jerusalem. And I ax him, how do you do, my sonny? O Jerusalem. I meet Titty Wessa in the morning, O Jerusalem, and I ax her, How do you do, my daughter? O Jerusalem. Titta Wissa means Sister Louisa. In songs of this class, the name of every person present successively appears. Their best marching song, the one which was invaluable to lift their feet along as they expressed it, was the following. There was a kind of spring and lilt to it, quite indescribable by words. 24. Go in the wilderness. Jesus call you, go in the wilderness. Go in the wilderness, go in the wilderness. Jesus call you, go in the wilderness, to wait upon de Lord. Go wait upon de Lord. Go wait upon de Lord. Go wait upon de Lord, my God. He take away de sins of de world. Jesus awaiting, go in the wilderness. Go. All dem chillen, go in the wilderness, to wait upon de Lord. The next one was one of those which I had heard in boyish days brought north from Charleston. But the chorus alone was identical. The words were mainly different, and those here given are quaint enough. 25. Blow your trumpet, Gabriel. Oh, blow your trumpet, Gabriel. Blow your trumpet louder. And I want dat trumpet to blow me home to my new Jerusalem. De prettiest ting dat ever I done was to serve de Lord when I was young. So blow your trumpet, Gabrielle. O oh, Satan is a liar, and he conjure too, and if you don't mind, he'll conjure you. So blow your trumpet, Gabrielle. O oh, I was lost in de wilderness. King Jesus hand me de candle down. So blow your trumpet, Gabrielle. The following contains one of those odd transformations of proper names with which their scriptural citations were often enriched. It rivals their text. Paul may plant and may polish with water, which I have elsewhere quoted, and in which the sainted Apollos would hardly have recognized himself. 26. In the morning. In de morning. In de morning. Chillin', yes, my lord. Don't you hear de trumpet sound? If I had a died when I was young, I never would had de race for run. Don't you hear de trumpet sound? O oh, Sam and Peter was fishing in de sea, and they dropped de net and follow my lord. Don't you hear de trumpet sound? There's a silver spade for to dig my grave, and a golden chain for to let me down. Don't you hear de trumpet sound? In de morning, in de morning. Chillin', yes, my lord. Don't you hear de trumpet sound? These golden and silver fancies remind me of one of King of Spain's daughters in Mother Goose, and the golden apple and the silver pear, which are doubtless themselves but the vestiges of some simple early composition like this. 
The next has a humbler and more domestic style of fancy. 27. Fare ye well. My true believers, fare ye well. Fare ye well. Fare ye well. Fare ye well by de grace of God, for I'm going home. Massa Jesus, give me a little broom, for to sweep my heart clean, and I will try, by de grace of God, to win my way home. Among the songs not available for marching, but requiring concentrated enthusiasm of the camp, was The Ship of Zion, of which they had three wholly distinct versions, all quite exuberant and tumultuous. 28. The Ship of Zion Come along, come along, and let us go home. O glory, hallelujah! Dis de old ship of Zion, hallelujah, hallelujah! Dis de old ship of Zion, hallelujah! She has landed many a thousand, she can land as many more. O glory, hallelujah! Do you think she will be able for to take us all home? O glory, hallelujah! You can tell em I'm a coming, hallelujah, hallelujah! You can tell em I'm a coming, hallelujah! Come along. Come along. 29. The Ship of Zion. Second Version. Dis de good old ship of Zion. Dis de good old ship of Zion. Dis de good old ship of Zion. And she's making for de promised land. She hab angels for de sailors. And she's. And how you know de angels. And she's. Good Lord, shall I be one? And she's. That ship is out a sailing, 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 and she's. She's a sailing mighty steady, 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 and she's. She'll neither reel nor totter, 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 and she's. She's a sailing away, cold Jordan, 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 and she's. King Jesus is de captain, 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 and she's making for de promised land. 30. The Ship of Zion, Third Version De gospel ship is sailing, Hosan, San. O Jesus is de captain, Hosan, San. De angels are de sailors, Hosan, San. O is your bundle ready, Hosan, San. O have you got your ticket, Hosan, San. This abbreviated chorus is given with unspeakable unction. The three just given are modifications of an old camp meeting melody, and the same may be true of the three following, although I cannot find them in the Methodist hymn books. Each, however, has its characteristic modifications, which make it well worth giving. In the second verse of this next, for instance, Saviour, evidently, has become soldier. 31. Sweet Music Sweet music in heaven, just beginning for to roll. Don't you love God? Glory, hallelujah. Yes, late I heard my soldier say, Come, heavy soul, I am de way. Don't you love God? Glory, hallelujah. I'll go and tell to sinners round What a saviour I have found. Don't you love God? Glory, hallelujah. My grief, my burden long has been Because I was not ceased from sin. Don't you love God? Glory, hallelujah. 32. Good News O oh, good news, O oh, good news, De angels brought de tidings down, Just coming from de throne. As grief from out my soul shall fly, Just coming from de throne. I'll shout salvation when I die, Good news, O oh, good news, Just coming from de throne. Lord, I want to go to heaven when I die, Good news, O oh, good news, De white folks call us a noisy crew. Good news, oh good news, but dis I know, we are happy too, just coming from de throne. 33. The Heavenly Road You may talk of my name as much as you please, and carry my name abroad, but I really do believe I'm a child of God, as I walk in de heavenly road. Oh, won't you go with me, thrice, for to keep our garments clean? O oh, Satan is a mighty busy old man, and roll rocks in my way, but Jesus is my bosom friend, and roll em out of de way. O oh, won't you go with me, thrice, for to keep our garments clean? 
Come, my brother, if you never did pray, I hope you may pray to-night. For I really believe in a child of God, as I walk in de heavenly road. Oh, won't you? Some of the songs had played an historic part during the war. For singing the next, for instance, the Negroes had been put in jail in Georgetown, S.C., at the outbreak of the rebellion. We'll soon be free was too dangerous an assertion, and though the chant was an old one, it was no doubt sung with redoubled emphasis during the new events. De Lord will call us home was evidently thought to be a symbolic verse. For as a drummer boy explained to me, showing all his white teeth as he sat in the moonlight by the door of my tent, they tink de Lord mean for say de Yankees. 34. We'll soon be free. We'll soon be free. We'll soon be free. We'll soon be free. When de Lord will call us home. My brother, how long? My brother, how long? My brother, how long? For we done suffering here. It won't be long, thrice. For de Lord will call us home. We'll walk de miry road, thrice. Where pleasure never dies. We'll walk de golden street, thrice. Where pleasure never dies. My brother, how long, thrice. For we done suffering here. We'll soon be free, thrice. When Jesus sets me free, we'll fight for liberty, thrice. When de Lord will call us home. The suspicion in this case was unfounded, but they had another song to which the rebellion had actually given rise. This was composed by nobody knew whom, though it was the most recent, doubtless, of all these spirituals, and had been sung in secret to avoid detection. It is certainly plaintive enough. The peck of corn and the pint of salt were slavery's rations. 35. Many thousand go. No more peck o' corn for me. No more, no more. No more peck o' corn for me. Many thousand go. No more driver's lash for me, twice. No more. No more pint o' salt for me, twice. No more. No more hundred lash for me, twice. No more. No more mistress call for me. No more, no more. No more mistress call for me. Many thousand go. Even of this last composition, however, we have only an approximate date, and know nothing of the mode of composition. Alan Ramsey says of the Scotch songs, that no matter who made them, they were soon attributed to the minister of the parish whence they sprang. And I always wondered about these, whether they had a conscious and definite origin in some leading mind, or whether they grew by gradual accretion in an almost unconscious way. On this point I could get no information, though I asked many questions, until at last one day when I was being rowed across the Beaufort to Ladies Island, I found myself with delight on the actual trail of a song. One of the oarsmen, a brisk young fellow, not a soldier, on being asked for his theory of the matter, dropped out a coy confession. Some good spirituals, he said, are just out of curiosity. I've been a razor sing myself once. My dream was fulfilled, and I had traced out not the poem alone, but the poet. I implored him to proceed. Once we boys, he said, went for totes some rice, and de nigger driver he keep a calling on us, and I say, oh, de old nigger driver. Then another said, fust ting my mammy told me was nothin so bad as nigger driver. Then I made a sing, just put in a word, and then another word. Then he began singing, and the men, after listening a moment, joined in the chorus, as if it were a, an old acquaintance, though they evidently had never heard it before. I saw how easily the new sing took root among them. 36. The Driver O oh, de old nigger driver, O oh, gwine away, Fusting my mamma tell me, O oh, gwine away, Tell me bout de nigger driver, O oh, gwine away, Nigger driver second devil, O oh, gwine away, Best ting for de he driver, O oh, gwine away, Knock he down and spoil de labour, O oh, gwine away. It will be observed that although this song is quite secular in its character, yet its author called it a spiritual. I heard but two songs among them at any time to which they would not, perhaps, have given this generic name. One of these consisted simply in the endless repetition, and the manner of certain college songs, of the mysterious line, Rainfall and wet Becky Lawton. 
but who becky lawton was and why she should or should not be wet and whether the dryness was a reward or a penalty none could say i got the impression that in either case the event was posthumous and that there was some tradition of grass not growing over the grave of a sinner but even this was vague and all else vaguer the other song i heard but once on a morning when a squad of men came in from picket duty and chanted it in the most rousing way it had been a stormy and comfortless night and the picket station was very exposed it still rained in the morning when i strolled to the edge of the camp looking out for the men and wondering how they had stood it presently they came striding along the road at a great pace with their shining rubber blankets worn as cloaks around them the rain streaming from these and from their equally shining faces which were almost all upon the broad grin as they peeled out this remarkable ditty hangman johnny oh they call me hangman johnny oh ho oh ho but i never hang nobody oh hang boys hang oh they call me hangman johnny oh ho oh ho but we'll all hang together oh hang boys hang my presence apparently checked the performance of another verse beginning de buckra list for money apparently in reference to the controversy about the pay question then just beginning and to the more mercenary aims they attributed to the white soldiers but hangman johnny remained always a myth as inscrutable as becky lawton as they learned all their songs by ear they often strayed into wholly new versions which sometimes became popular and entirely banished the others this was amusingly the case for instance with one phrase in the popular camp song of marching along which was entirely new to them until our quartermaster taught it to them at my request the words gird on the armour were to them a stumbling block and no wonder until some ingenious ear substituted guide on de army which was at once accepted and became universal will guide on de army and be marching along is now the established version on the sea islands these quaint religious songs were to the men more than a source of relaxation they were a stimulus to courage and a tie to heaven i never overheard in camp a profane or vulgar song with the trifling exceptions given all had a religious motive while the most secular melody could not have been more exciting a few youths from savannah who were comparatively men of the world had learned some of the ethiopian minstrel ditties imported from the north these took no hold upon the mass and on the other hand they sang reluctantly even on sunday the long and short meters of the hymn books always gladly yielding to the more potent excitement of their own spirituals but these they could sing themselves as had their fathers before them out of the contemplation of their own low estate into the sublime scenery of the apocalypse i remember that this minor keyed pathos used to seem to me almost too sad to dwell upon while slavery seemed destined to last for generations but now that their patience had had its perfect work history cannot afford to lose this portion of its record there is no parallel instance of an oppressed race thus sustained by religious sentiment alone these songs are but the vocal expression of the simplicity of their faith and the sublimity of their long resignation end of chapter 9 recording by fnh visit www.bookranger.co.uk